update us on Operation Resolute Support. Uh, General, we'll turn it over to you for your opening comments. Jeff, thank you very much. And uh, again, good morning to everybody. And, and all, as always, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to cover this story. I know there's an awful lot ongoing right now, uh, so we do think it's important and we do appreciate it. I want to begin, though, today by, uh, by once again extending our deepest sympathies and our condolences to the family and those who were lost in the attack this week here in Kabul. And our thoughts are with their families uh, and our thoughts are with their friends. So shifting over a little bit to the, uh, the tactical situation, what I want to do is I do want to describe a little bit about where we are uh, as of October 2016. But I think it's important first to really uh, look at the larger Taliban strategic goal. So if you go back to April of 2016, what we saw was that the Taliban launched Operation Omar, their offensive for this year. And their goal for this year has always been to capture a provincial capital. And we think that's what we're seeing right now. We think we're seeing an effort by the Taliban to try and absolutely uh, capture a provincial capital. And we think we realize, or they realize, that they're coming close to the end of the year and they want to do it before the winter sets in. But I think it's also just as important to remember <clears throat> The, the, the Taliban have not been slept for it actually started at the beginning of August. And I think as many of you remember, that really started first in Lashkar Gah that went on for about 10 days. It then shifted up north into Kunduz, subsequently into Tarankot. And now we've seen efforts again against Kunduz, Lashkar Gah, and Farah. But again, Taliban have been their strategic objective. And while the ANDSF effort has not been always perfect and it has not always been pretty, they have been able to successfully defend uh, each of their major population centers and each of their provincial capitals. But with that said, the last few weeks have certainly reinforced to us what already which is this is a tough fight and we do have a ways to go and the ANDSF still has challenges and we're going to continue to work with them uh, to help them improve. So let me begin first up in Kunduz and tell you what we saw, and then I'll shift around the country just a little bit. <clears throat> so once the Kunduz situation began, for us, it was really never a question of whether the city was going to fall. We were confident that the city was not going to fall. The real question became, how long is it going to take to clear out these pockets of Taliban that have moved into the city? And so the reason we think that is really on the first night, we believe that the Taliban are not going to be successful in trying to take the city as they did just a year ago in 2015. So at that point, what we think is that they decided to try and prolong this fight for as long as they possibly could. And the reason for that really is, number one, uh, it got an awful lot of press coverage. And then number two, it helps put additional suffering on the people of Kunduz. And when that happens, that then puts additional pressure on the government. And so we did see that. We saw the Taliban absolutely destroyed parts of the city. They uh, destroyed the power grid, which then resulted in a loss of electricity and water. We saw them go ahead and destroy uh, cell towers as well as several civilian re residences. And you know, the situation was obviously not anything that anybody wanted to see. At the end of the day, the ANDSF did successfully hold the city and then they subsequently cleared the city. And it did take them a while, but those in the military do know that to try and clear an enemy out of an urban environment and not cause further destruction is a very difficult tactical problem. And so at the end of the day, though, we did see that the Afghans have first held their city and then second off, they were able to clear it. So let me shift now down to Helmen a little bit. And uh, again, Hellman continues to be the Taliban main effort, and they are committing a lot of resources into it, and they're committing a lot of energy into it. But it is a little bit different from Kunduz in that the activity is kind of happening all over the province. And so what we've seen are these series of raids by the Taliban against checkpoints. <clears throat> we've seen them engage district centers, and then we've also seen them put some pressure uh, on Lashkar Gah. But again, the ANDSF has successfully secured Lashkar Gah, and they've now brought in additional reinforcements. And they've also put in a new corps commander, and that new corps commander has recognized that the security forces were frankly spread too thin over the province of Helmand. So he has made a decision to withdraw some of those forces, bring them back into Lashkar Gah to defend the city, and then be prepared to move on to the offense. And so we are seeing that right now. And then finally in Farah, 
what I think we saw in Para was that the Taliban thought perhaps they could have an easy win. And so, of course, they did attack uh, Farah City uh, with the intent to try and capture it. And after some initial fighting, frankly, the 207th War, which is very well led out there in the West, they were able to get the upper hand. They have secured the city, and now they are pushing their security bubble uh, out further. So I say all that, but what I would tell you is what we know is that the fighting is not over. We fully expect that the Taliban is absolutely going to take another run at Lashkar Gah, and that could happen very soon. They'll likely try and uh, take a run at Tarakot, and there may be another provincial capital as well. And on top of that, we do still fully expect that we are going to see additional high-profile attacks uh, here in the near future as the Taliban recognizes the end of the year is coming soon. So we take a step back and we really look at the larger context. And again, we compare 2015 with 2016. We do still believe that the ANDSF performance this year in 16 has been better than last year. <clears throat> and it's, there's been gradual progress, and we see it at the tactical level, but we also see it in, at the institutional level. But again, that does not mean that things are perfect by any stretch. And it doesn't mean that the war is back over. It does mean, and I mentioned it earlier, is that we do recognize that this is a tough fight and we do still have a lot of challenges in front of us that we'll continue to work at. But as you look at the year in total and you really look March to July of this year, the a and barge was on the offense and they were following their campaign plan. Then in August, that's when we saw the Taliban really begin to try and take one of these provincial capitals. And again, they have failed. They have not been successful in their multiple efforts to try and do that. Today. General Nicholson uh, briefed you last month on this, but overall we do believe we have hit an equilibrium. And what we mean by that is the government controls about two-thirds of the population. The Taliban controls or influences up to 10 percent of the population. And then that other 20 plus percent is really contested right now. And that's where we're seeing the, the overall fighting. The final thing I want to talk about, and then I uh, will pause and, and certainly open up for your questions, is I want to talk a little bit about our efforts against the Islamic State Khorasan, ISK, are also known as Daesh. And as General Nicholson said before, our efforts here are really a part of the larger U.S. as well as international efforts to try and target Daesh wherever they are and defeat them. And so I think everybody remembers, obviously, it's last January, where our U.S. forces here received both the mission and the authorities to aggressively target uh, Daesh. And so that's what we've been doing. We've been doing that since January, and we'll continue to do that. But as General Nicholson also briefed you in July, there are periods where we will bring in additional capability, and we will work with the partners, our Afghan partners, and we will pick up the pace of operations and the tempo so that we can put additional pressure on Daesh. Obviously, we did that in July, and we're just completing a similar operation uh, right now. This particular operation uh, really occurred in Achenangahar, and it uh, started the, uh, the last week of September and went really until about the second week of October, uh, somewhere in there. Um, it was spearheaded by Afghan special forces, specifically their commandos, who really started at the northern part of the district, and they moved south, uh, clear and distant as they moved along. Once they concluded, the 201st Corps, which is the conventional corps uh, in that area, then also sent two battalions down to continue that effort. And then finally, all of that was, of course, supplemented by U.S. support. So during this period of about two weeks, uh, airstrikes uh, on Daesh positions. Uh, we did also put uh, U.S. special forces into their typical advisory role. So they moved along with the commandos as those commandos moved south. Uh, we did conduct about three partnered raids uh, with our Afghan partners, and those were to destroy uh, Daesh command and control nodes. <clears throat> and then finally, as the 201st Corps moved in, we continued our train, advise, and assist of that conventional force, not in the field, but at their core headquarters to continue to provide assistance to them. <clears throat> and overall, we believe that this effort was successful. <clears throat> Excuse me. So collectively, in terms of the work that the Afghans and the U.S. did, we believe that we attributed the Daesh in strength by about 15 to 20 percent. So where does that leave us? We think, and this is an estimate, but we think that leaves us really with about 1,000 or so uh, Daesh members still in the area. We know that we destroyed multiple command and control locations and logistics locations, and then we also pushed Daesh further south 
and we're able to take some of that territory back. <clears throat> so as we move forward, again, our effort here is absolutely a part of this larger international effort, and we will continue to keep pressure on them at every opportunity. And then we will also, in the future, conduct similar operations like this, as, well, as has been noted by General Nicholson uh, and others. So with that, Jeff, uh, thank you very much, and I'll pause there, and I welcome your questions. Sure, sir. I, we actually had some, uh, this is uh, not the best connection here while you were doing this. If I can ask, if we're just going to try to do a quick reconnect just so we get clear video for the rest of it. I think we caught everything you said, but the video, unfortunately, is going to be unusable in some spots. If I could just ask our, our control room to do a quick reconnect, and while we do that, I'll take uh, the folks who would like questions. I don't know your name. Oh, Travis. Yeah. Holy, I haven't seen you in years. Good to see you. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I had a question. Well, hold on. Let's wait till we reconnect to him. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Kyle Grasso, you're talking Kyle? Are you in? Richard, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Sir, are we back up? about this and uh, obviously we've been wrestling with this for a while we'll continue to work it yep. if you're uh, if you can hear us and we can hear you our first question is from Travis Tritton with Stars and Stripes uh, yeah uh, uh, regarding the Taliban um, yeah the video was garbled and I was hoping you could just repeat I think that you gave percentages of control of the country could you just run through that one more time please Jeff, I'm sorry, I couldn't completely hear Travis's question. Would you mind repeating that for me? Oh, that was in style here. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me now? I can hear you better. Thank you. Great. Um, regarding the Taliban, um, I believe that you had uh, given some percentages of control of the country, but it was garbled in the video feed. I was hoping you could just kind of repeat that. Sure, you bet. So what we're focused on, Travis, is we're really on population control. And the reason we're focused on that because the Afghans are focused on that. And so right now we believe that the Taliban control or influence about 10% of the Afghan population. Uh, we believe that the government controls about two thirds of the population. And then the balance between the two is really the contested area. Uh, next we'll go to Kyle. You wanna try back there if you can speak up, we can, we can probably hear you. Thank you so much for taking the time to inform us today. Uh, my question is about the government's support of both the U.S. and Afghanistan. Um, I know a lot of attention has been on Iraq and Mosul in the past week, but do you feel that you have the support and the resources that you need to continue your mission in Afghanistan? Just to make sure I'm, I'm clear, Kyle, I think you're asking, do we feel like we have enough resources despite all the attention uh, on Iraq? It was, is that your question? That's correct. Great. Yeah, the, the short answer is yes, we do. Uh, you know, obviously, General Nicholson stays in very close contact uh, with his chain of command, and he is comfortable with the resources we have right now to prosecute both of the missions he's been given. <clears throat> the first is the counterterrorism mission, and then the second is the train, advise, and assist mission, which is a part of the larger NATO mission. Uh, next to Richard Sisk with military.com. Uh, hi, General. You mentioned a, uh, a new commander, AND, uh, ANDSF, in, uh, in Helmand. Who is that? And is he replacing the one uh, that was uh, brought in last year to replace a previous commander who was uh, basically ousted because of corruption? What's going on there, General? Sure. So the new commander is Brigadier General Ahmed Zadi. And uh, again, I, I'm sure I just butchered the pronunciation of it. Uh, he was uh, a commander up in <coughs> the Kunar area and yeah, six months, down about uh, two plus weeks or so ago and simply stated, I think the government of Afghanistan uh, wanted to get some additional uh, new life into uh, the effort there by the 215th Corps. So as you may recall, uh, the 215th Corps really, uh, we spent a lot of time last winter uh, helping generally a number of leaders were replaced. Uh, there was a Corps commander who was put in about last February or so, but this new commander uh, has taken over for that, uh, that Corps commander. Uh, who 
is that core commander who was replaced? His name was I don't know. I'm sorry, we lost you there. Could you say that again, sir? Yeah, his name was General Moeen, and, and we can help you with the spelling after this, if, if that would be of assistance. Basically, you have a, um, you have a new commander of the 215th. When, uh, when was he put in place? It was, uh, we can get you the specific dates after this, but it was about two and a half weeks ago. Lastly, General, can you tell us, um, have any, um, any withdrawals of uh, U.S. troops begun yet to uh, get down to 8,500? Sure. So, again, I think everybody uh, is well aware that by the 1st of January, uh, we will, U.S. forces will be at or below 8,400 uh, troops. Uh, General Nicholson did address this a little bit uh, last time, and so for operational security reasons, of course, I don't want to provide all the details. But first off, we're going to move down to 8,400 uh, really by reconfiguring some of the advisor packages that we have out here forward. So we have learned a lot of lessons over the last 18 to 20 months. We've recognized that there was some capability that we really didn't need, and then we recognized that we want to reconfigure those. So as units come out here and they replace current units, those new units will come out in the new configuration and be prepared uh, to do their part uh, at 8,400. The second aspect is we are moving some ability uh, over the horizon. Uh, a lot of that is kind of administrative, um, you know, things that you don't physically have to be in Afghanistan to do. That process has already started, so we're in the process of moving uh, some of those people right now. And then finally, we will use some allies as well as civilians, as well as contractors uh, to fill in the other pieces. And so that is an effort that, that is underway right now as well. Okay. Uh, next, uh, Andrew Tillman from Military Times. Yeah, hi. Um, my question was basically uh, Richard's question about the drawdown. Um, but f following up, uh, it sounds like you're saying that you do not expect to lose any real capability uh, between now and uh, next year when you reduce the size of the force by 15 percent or so. Is that, is that fair? Do you think that the, the three things that you described, and in particular the replacing some of those forces with um, civilians and, and allied forces, um, you feel like you're going to be a steady state in terms of capability from 2016 to, into 2017? Andrew, yes, General Nicholson does believe that. And again, I think the key thing that I want to highlight from a capability standpoint is the difference between 8,400 and 5,500 is the ability to continue to train, advise, and assist missions at the core and at the police zone level. So staying at 8,400 will give us that capability uh, down in Helmand, in Kandahar, uh, in the Ghazni area, as well as in the Nangahar uh, Logman area. And so from a capability standpoint, uh, we will be able to continue that. And then the counterterrorism capability uh, will remain in on also. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, Paul. General, uh, can you give us a sense of how many uh, airstrikes you've taken against ISIS in Nangarhar, and then how many against the Taliban? And are there more strikes against ISIS or the Taliban? And also with the, uh, the soft um, advising effort, um, you have Helmand, Nangarhar, you know, Kunduz and other places. How are you dividing that? And are NATO troops also taking part in those, in those operations? Sure, thank you. So, Paul, let me first off uh, start with the, uh, the ISK uh, strikes. Uh, really, since the beginning of 2016, uh, we have taken uh, about 230 counterterrorism strikes. And so when I say counterterrorism, those are focused on uh, Daesh uh, as well as Al-Qaeda. So about uh, two-thirds to three-quarters of those are focused on uh, Daesh and then the, the remaining amount uh, on Al-Qaeda. You ask how many strikes we've taken about the Taliban or against the Taliban, and we don't really have a good number for you. And the reason I say that is, again, we are not authorized to target the Taliban uh, by status. 
Um, what we are able to do is, number one, our first authority is always force protection. So we're able to, uh, you know, defend ourselves and use fires to do so. Obviously, there's the CT authority I just described. But then we also have the authority to help uh, prevent a strategic defeat. But most recently, to help the Afghans achieve their strategic effects, so the strategic effects authority. And to really kind of understand that last authority, you do have to kind of understand the Afghan campaign plan uh, strategically they have been working towards. And it's not an authority to attack just being members of the Taliban. We do have the authority, though, to target those who are impeding the Afghans as they work towards their strategic campaign plan. Uh, does that kind of help? Uh, yeah, I mean, all that seems to cover being able to target the Taliban anywhere, anytime they're near Afghan forces. I mean, you can always say they're impeding strategic, you know, plan, right? Well, and, and just to give you kind of a sense of it, since we received those authorities for the strategic effects uh, in June, um, we've taken really, again, about 240 strikes uh, associated with those uh, authorities. And then you also asked about the, uh, the special operations forces and, you know, the size of their elements and where they are. And again, NATO's mission here is to train, advise, and assist. And at the special operations forces level, uh, we do have the ability, of course, uh, to put NATO forces uh, out with the special operations forces at a, at a tactical level. That is uncommon. Uh, about 80% of Afghan special operations uh, are conducted independent of anything we're doing. Uh, the, of that remaining 20%, uh, about 10% of those are what we refer to as enabled, where we may assist with planning or ISR uh, or logistics or something along those lines. And then the remaining 10%, we will have forces go out and accompany those Afghan special forces. They are not limited to one geographic location. Typically, Afghan special forces have a habitual relationship with the core that they're working uh, for, but they've got the ability to move from province to province, uh, as well as, if required, they can be moved to other parts of the country. And so uh, when we assist them, uh, our team would, would do the same thing. So they've got the ability to move from province to province or to other places in the country uh, as needed. The typical size, there's really not a typical size. It all kind of depends on the requirements of the mission, but it, as you probably know, U.S. Special Forces typically operate in smaller teams, uh, so we're talking 10 to 20, uh, uh, those, those, those types of elements. Okay. Yeah, Louis Martinez with ABC News. Hi, General. Um, I was hoping you could provide some clarity about the incident earlier this week that was described as an insider attack um, at uh, Camp Moorhead. Uh, do you have any more details to support that? Sure, Lou. Um, as I'm sure you, you're already aware, the entire event is uh, under investigation right now. And so a lot of the questions will be answered as a part of this investigation. And I don't have a tremendous amount uh, of new information for you. But <clears throat> let me tell you and hopefully frame it with what we do uh, think happened. Uh, number one, uh, we sent uh, a team of advisors out to conduct essentially an inspection of an ammunition supply point. And this is not an uncommon event. It's part of our work with the ministries here because obviously trying to help the Afghans uh, learn how to do this is really part of building an institution. And so, again, this is not an everyday occurrence, but it's also not an uncommon occurrence. The actual ASP uh, was just on the edge of an Afghan base. Uh, so the team uh, drove up. Um, they, they walked to the entry control point or the they, they approached and then it was some point there where they the incident happened, where they received fire. Uh, the incident was over uh, relatively soon, and uh, as we've described, the shooter uh, was found dead. Uh, he was wearing an Afghan uniform. Uh, obviously, the investigation is seeking to confirm uh, whether or not this qualifies officially as a as an insider attack or a green on blue, uh, because we don't yet have the identity uh, of the shooter, and that's something that will come about uh, with the investigation. But Lou, that's really a, a, about what we have right now. Uh, does that help? Shift gears and ask you another question about Lashkar Gah. You talked about how the commander there has essentially decided to uh, retrench and focus uh, on the defense of Lashkar Gah. 
Um, I mean, obviously that's a tactical decision, but strategically, does that impact the notion that the Taliban is gaining the upper hand um, in that area? Yeah, we, we don't think so. And the reason I say that is, again, the Taliban's strategic goal right now is to take that a provincial capital. Lashkar Gah, of course, would be a huge prize for them. And so I think what this new commander is working to do is, again, consolidate some forces, bring in some reinforcements, make sure that he can defend Lashkar Gah and prevent the Taliban from achieving their strategic goal, and then prepare to move out on the offense. Uh, and we believe that's what we're seeing right now. And again, I, I don't want to understate the Taliban capabilities, but we also shouldn't overstate their capabilities. Either. They've taken a lot and they hit pretty hard uh, as well. And so what we expect to see fairly soon again is that the ANDSF moving back out on the offense. Uh, Lucas Tomlinson with Fox News. General, do you think the United States and the Afghan government will ever defeat the Taliban? Lucas, thanks. Um, the goal for the government of Afghanistan is to ultimately come to a negotiated solution with the Taliban. Um, so our expectation, and then we've said this before, is that there's really not a military solution uh, to what's happening here in Afghanistan. It's absolutely going to happen. It's owned and led uh, process uh, that leads to reconciliation. The battle akin to the, the war against, uh, let's say, gangs here in the United States that despite, uh, you know, a lot of uh, policing, a lot of money, a lot of programs, that uh, this is just an unwinnable solution? Yeah, Lucas, un unfortunately, I, I just don't, uh, uh, I don't really have the expertise to kind of address or draw a comparison or a contrast uh, uh, between what you describe. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I, I just don't have the background to be able to draw. What I would tell you again, though, Lucas, is, again, we've, we're focused on two missions, and they're complementary. And uh, <coughs> the first mission being the counterterrorism mission, which is to protect the United States and protect the West and be able to keep pressure on these terrorist organizations. And then the second aspect is to, again, train, advise, and assist the Afghans so that they can get to a point where they can defend their own borders and they can also uh, address these trans-regional terrorists that do operate in this region. Lastly, uh, speaking of terrorists, uh, is, how involved is the U.S. military mission to root out and kill senior al-Qaeda leaders that are still in the mountains of eastern Afghanistan? And are those terrorists still planning attacks on the West, including the United States? Lucas, I'm sorry, you can tell I've got a cold today, so please bear with me. Um, uh, we do believe that al-Qaeda does maintain a presence here in Afghanistan, and we do think there's two components to it. There is an aspect that is related to the core al-Qaeda, and then there is al-Qaeda's newest franchise, uh, al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. And so their goals are just a little bit different, but they're all part of the franchise. We do believe that al-Qaeda maintains a presence, maintains a presence uh, up in Kunar, but they also occasionally do have a presence further south, uh, be it in Zabal. Obviously, we saw an al-Qaeda presence in Kandahar uh, last year as well. We've seen them in the P2, or the Paktia, Paktika coast uh, area as well. And so, again, our mission is to absolutely target them, and to absolutely go after them at any uh, any opportunity that we have. And so we'll continue to do that. Restrictions on going after these senior al-Qaeda leaders, like if they're living with family or friends, other civilians, that airstrikes can't take place? I'm sorry, Lucas, could you repeat that, please? Are there any restrictions on targeting these senior al-Qaeda leaders in eastern Afghanistan because they're living with their family, friends, or perhaps other civilians? Well, as obviously, Lucas, I, I don't want to talk about how our targeting uh, occurs or you know, the intentions are there. We absolutely do follow the rules of engagement. We absolutely follow uh, the law of armed conflict, and we'll continue to do that. But beyond that, I, I really don't want to describe uh, the way we target. Andrew Tillman, I think you had a follow-up. I wanted just to follow up Louis' question about the incident uh, the other day at the ammunition supply point. You say that that was a, 
Um, it started out as a, an inspection. It, can you just to clarify what an inspection is? Is that where basically <clears throat> the uh, U.S. and Afghan forces go out to make sure that uh, what's on the books is actually in the storage facility? Is it, a, is it an accountability thing? That, that's absolutely it, and, and it, it is an accountability thing. Obviously, uh, the U.S. military, you know, counts uh, ammunition down to the the smallest piece of brass constantly, uh, and it's it's obviously from an accountability standpoint, a safety standpoint as part of these institutions and help the Ministry of Defense uh, continue to grow and continue to evolve. Being able to account for your material uh, is is a huge part of it because it speaks to the larger aspect of how do you resupply, how do you forecast what you need in the future. So part of the effort is to help uh, the Afghans get to a point where they can do this themselves. And it gets um, it's institutional work doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but it's absolutely critical for any institution to be able to run. Were they able to carry out that inspection, or did this whole sh shooting incident derail that? The, uh, the incident occurred before they accessed it, so they, they had not started the inspection. Okay, uh, Travis, I think you got a follow-up as well. Travis Tritton. Sure. Uh, this is on the insider attack as well. Um, what are you doing in the wake of that to um, offer more security to U.S. forces there and ensure that another similar attack doesn't happen? And also, what's your message to the Afghan forces who bear some responsibility for security? Sure. So um, obviously, the because it's under investigation right now, what will come from that investigation are a number of tactical lessons learned. How can we do this better, et cetera? And so we will incorporate that into into what we're doing. But despite this incident, what I would tell you is we are still absolutely committed to the larger mission of training, advising, and assisting uh, our Afghan partners. And I would tell you also our Afghan partners who genuinely do want us here. They want the assistance. They are as absolutely horrified uh, about this uh, as anybody. And so at the very tactical level, we'll learn from this. We'll uh, do an evaluation of what happened, how can we get better, and how can we make modifications uh, to the way that we are doing business. But the larger mission will continue, and we remain committed uh, to working with our Afghan partners. Okay, uh, Louis Martinez, I believe you had a follow-up. We recently heard about how uh, ISIS in Iraq has been using drones, um, either with uh, IED capability or for surveillance capability. Um, and I guess there's news out today that the Taliban has released a video uh, showing their use of a drone capability in some kind of attack. Um, is this a capability you're aware of beforehand? Uh, is this something new? Uh, what do we know about it? Yeah, Lou, unfortunately, I, I, I am not aware uh, of that video. We, we have not seen that type of thing before, and so I really don't have a lot of, uh, of good information for you. And regardless of the video, is this a capability, the drone capability, something that Taliban has used before or that we knew that they might have? Yeah, again, Lou, we, we have not seen that capability up to this point, so I, I am not aware uh, of them having a drone capability. Okay, last call. Anybody else? Uh, Lucas Tomlinson. Uh, General, any update on the two soldiers that were wounded in the roadside bomb earlier this month in Nangarhar? Um, Lucas, I, I don't have an update for you. Uh, those soldiers, uh, again, departed the theater. Uh, and so uh, those, those answers are probably back uh, with the service. Okay, General, thank you very much for your time. And uh, we hope you get over your cold and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much. And again, to everybody, I do appreciate you taking the time today. And as always, if we can help you out, please reach out to us, and we're more than happy to do all we can. Thank you.